Thank you very much. Um, thank you to the uh, Minister, Madam Minister, and the distinguished guests. Um, I would like to um, share some slides with you, uh, but in a moment, I just like to give you a little bit of background. Uh, I've been working in the mining industry uh, for 30 years in the safety and health field, and I've uh, started my career in South Africa. I worked for many years in Australia. And I also now live in Canada, where my work is across North America. And I have to um, unfortunately say that I think this, the news on safety is not very good. Uh, and I'll show you in a moment why I say that. Uh, we, are, we are not improving in safety in the same way as we've, we've done before. Uh, but there are some good news uh, I'd like to share with you uh, in my uh, presentation and to give you some ideas on what to invest in in the workplace and in safety. The uh, uh, Madam Minister had made a very strong point that uh, safety is about the mindsets of people, uh, what we understand, how we see safety, how we see risk. And those are the areas of investment that I would like to show you and share with you. But if I can share my screens to um, give you the uh, background information. The topics that I would like to discuss with you is about the effects of accidents in the workplace, in organizations. I'd like to share with you ideas about OHS and the human factor, and what solutions are there now advancing in the field internationally? And then what are the benefits of investing in, in OHS? Now, when you say to uh, a mining manager, a mining company, they have to invest in safety. Uh, they immediately think of equipment, uh, very nice, shiny equipment, or even they think of uh, safety equipment. But what I would like to encourage you for investment is not in the equipment side, but it is very much in the field of people. And this is not an investment that will be very visible. It is an investment that will have long-term benefits for you. Uh, I have worked for many organizations in my career. You see that all the big mining companies I have uh, worked for as a consultant uh, in many fields. My career started in South Africa. Uh, as a, I'm a trained psychologist. And my first job was on a platinum mine. And as I started my career there, the manager of this mine immediately told me to go and work underground for eight months so that I can understand what people do and how, what risks they are facing. Now, if I can just explain to you very briefly what a mine in South Africa looks like. These are the, the typical mine shafts that exist in that environment. So you go on the ground and you sink down in a shaft 10,000 meters. You walk to another shaft, another 10,000 meters, and you would go to an even third level of another 10,000 meters, a uh, thousand meters, and you sometimes have to walk four kilometers to your workplace. And this is what the workplace looked like where I started my career. And I worked here for eight months in an environment that is only one meter high. The rock temperatures are 70 degrees and the temperature in the air is 40 degrees Celsius. And above my head is 2,500 meters of rock. And this is where I learned what the real risks of mining are. And I also understood here for the first time, the value of people 
And that's why I want to encourage you to look at this because the effects of safety, the effects of accidents are very horrific uh, in, to say the least. If you look at accident trends in the global mining industry today, and I'll look at a few countries. If you look at United States between 2008 and 2018, and you look at the fatalities by year, it's a disturbing picture. Over that period of time, the trend is even slightly on the increase. It improved since 2015, but since then, not anymore. If you look at the accident rates in coal fatalities in the United States, you see that the trend is not very positively lower. In fact, the last few years, the trend is on the increase. Now, if you look at a company, a country like Australia, who is very highly regarded in safety, and then some very disturbing information coming through about Australia. In the last year, in 2019, they've actually had the highest number of fatalities that they've ever had in their, in their history. And the high potential events are on the increase. This is very disturbing information. We are not improving our ability to stop killing people in the industry. If you look at United States safety, all figures, all, uh, all occupations combined, you see that there is an improvement up to 2008 of 64% in injury rates. But after that, the rate of improvement is only 16%. If you look at the fatality rates, you see that up to that same period of time, we improved 32% in, in the United States, but since then, only 2% improvement. It is as if we are hitting a wall. We are not improving anymore. In fact, you can see the fatality rates in the United States are increasing now. And yet, what we are doing in, 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 in safety, in mine safety, we are doing all these interventions. We analyze and prevent accidents. We engineer safe work environments. We make new rules. We educate people. We eliminate risky behaviors and we set targets. We are actually doing good safety management, but we're not improving. Now, the information that I show you now is extremely disturbing. This is uh, one of the largest industries in the United States. They generate almost all the power in the United States. And there's 28 organizations. And you can see there on the left, the organization who has the lowest injury rates in the country. They are high performing companies in safety. On the right hand side, you see the poor performing com companies that have a very ha much higher injury rate. They call it the DART rate. If you look at the deaths, you see a very disturbing picture. You notice there that 21 of the 34 deaths occurred over the 12 years with the organizations that had the best safety performance when it is measured by injury rates. 62% of the accidents, fatal accidents happened in organizations that are supposedly the best. Something is very, very wrong if that's the data. If you have a look at disasters, mining and other disasters over the world in the last 30, 40 years, these are 27 disasters that happened around the world in which more than 6,000 people were killed. You would remember Bhopal, India, uh, where almost uh, 4,000 people died. This was owned by Union Carbide. Union Carbide was a very advanced safety oriented company. Today, it is Dow Chemicals, biggest chemical company in the world. You would also remember Piper Alpha, in 1988, when 167 men killed, and this oil rig had recently, six months before, won a safety competition as the best oil rig in the North Sea. Texas refinery of BP, they have also 15 people killed, and yet they were regarded as this, one of the safest companies in the Texas refining industry. And then more recently, the Deepwater Horizon, again, BP, 11 people killed, BP, an advanced company. 
Even DuPont, that has an incredible safety record, had a disaster uh, a few years ago in where four people were killed and it could have been many more. In the company that I worked, Billiton, uh, 177 people killed in a mine disaster as a result of a safety device that went wrong. In Australia, the story goes on. It is the North Parks Mine won this, the Minix Award. It is Australia's prestigious safety award. And four months later, 24 people were killed on that mine. One of the safest mines in the world who received the five-star rating from DNV in South Africa had an had accident on one of these were out of action on that day. They had the most advanced systems. They had incredibly strong protections. The shaft gates were strongly protecting the, 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 the shaft system. And yet, on that day, 11 safety systems failed. And this is a mine that had achieved a five-star rating in safety. One of the more recent very tragic events in mining, and this is a very well-known one, this is the Vale mine in Brazil, and this is the tailings dam. And this is the video of that tailings dam collapsing. And you can see how the debris is starting to roll out of that mine, that tailings dam, and it's starting to go through the living areas. It is squashing everything in its path. massive amounts of mud going through down this river. And that's what it looked like afterwards. And you would remember 259 people killed in this event. Something is not right. These companies all focused on safety. They all wanted their employees to comply to the rules. They all had very advanced technology and systems in place, and they achieved almost zero accidents. They were well-managed organizations. My strong feeling and my assessment is that it is time to change what we do in safety. And in your case, you are in a very good position to build in this new thinking into the way that you think in safety. We have to, for instance, be careful about the migration of risks. We have an idea that we can simply stop events like in the domino example, but the moment we start to introduce improvements on safety to prevent an accident, we get some strange reactions. And this is a video clip that shows it in a, in a, in a light-hearted way. If you have a look at the... Now, as I said, it is a light-hearted way. They've solved the problem of smokers. They have to go outside, but then they created another risk. Here, in a more serious way, is an example of an accident that happened on a coal mine in Australia. He put his water sprays off for another truck that he thought is coming on that side. These people behind him thought that it was for them, and they overtook. And the, uh, two people were killed here. What the management decided to do was to, over, to, to ban overtaking. No light vehicle can overtake any large truck anymore. But then what happened after that, when the rule was introduced, is when people started driving on the whole roads, they started noticing a truck would come 
and they approached the same intersection, they try to get in front of trucks in order to prevent themselves not being caught behind the truck. And many more accidents started to happen. So the solution to the one accident created the next accident and many more. And this could be indications of why are we not improving anymore? Because we are not solving problems, we are just moving them around. When you look at the analysis of accidents, and this is a very typical methodology to use for accident analysis, the five whys, most of the time, these analyses end up, it is the human fault. Humans make mistakes. And this brings us to the topic of OHNS and the human factor. Now, it is true that the human being has many failures. We get fatigued. We become complacent. We uh, may become careless. And in many ways, we are not equipped for high-risk work. But often, what happens is we underestimate what really happens in the workplace, in the human mind. So what I want to do is I want to show you a picture. And I want to ask you very simply, what do you think is on that picture? Just describe it to yourself. And what you're going to start saying to yourself is, that is a spoon, but really in reality, it is a fork. In your mind, you saw a spoon. You made an assumption that there will be a spoon in there. Now, what I want to illustrate with this is that this simple mistake that you've just made was the basic reason why 167 men died on the oil rig Piper Alpha. And here is what happened. Piper Alpha was connected to two other oil rigs, Claymore and Tartan, and they were pumping oil to the Scottish coast. Piper Alpha had a friction on Piper Alpha, but they also lost radio contact with the other oil rigs. And then what unfortunately happened was all the oil from the other two oil rigs started coming back to Piper Alpha. And a small fire became a very large fire. And the uh, Piper Alpha exploded and 167 men killed. And here is the explosion. Now, what happened was the other oil rigs continued producing oil because they assumed that Piper Alpha will extinguish the fire with their water deluge system, which is automatic. But it didn't come into operation. It was defective. It was switched off. And they made an assumption, and the accident happened, just like your assumption that there was a spoon in the, in the cup. What I want to illustrate with this is that human mistakes are extremely common, but they are not really mistakes because it is a logical conclusion that you came to that there is a spoon in there. And yet, in the wrong circumstances, these mistakes become catastrophic events. When we look at compliance, and we want people to comply to rules. Now, I want to be giving you a, a bit of a caution about the term blind compliance. This is what I call the sigmoid curve. And at the bottom here are, if you increase protections around people, you give them more and more protections and systems, and you can see there is the accident rates. What happens, and it's called the sigmoid curve, that as you give people more and more protection, the accident rates come down, but then it starts to plateau, bottom out. At first, people are ignorant, then they become observant, then they conform, 
and then they comply. But when they comply, and if you have a look at this uh, table here, people can take risks or act safely. They can break rules or they can follow rules. When they break rules and they take risks, this is the very dangerous area. If you think about driving on the roads, safely, this is where you will see people driving at or under the speed limit, or you will see pedestrians crossing at pedestrian crossings. But in traffic, in traffic safety, they call this the 85th percentile, because what happens is most road accidents happens in the area where people act safely and follow rules, because most accidents happen at or under the speed limit. And most pedestrians in the United States are killed at pedestrian crossings because of the change of behavior of the pedestrian. And here is a pedestrian crossing. And you can see he's not looking left or right because he is right. He's complying. And then something went wrong and he is run over. He did not make any mistake. He was fully complying to all the rules, and yet he was seriously injured. And this is what unfortunately happens when we protect people with systems and protections in safety. We lose our awareness because we feel protected. And this is also what happened on Piper Alpha. This here is the accommodation block. When a fire, the fire started, it started in this area here. And all the workers here remember that the rule for emergency evacuation is they have to go to the accommodation block. And they all walked to the accommodation block following the rule. One young man realized he was a helicopter pilot licensed person. He realized that that helicopter pad a helicopter will never land on it because a pilot will not land on a burning oil rig. And he realized the only chance for survival is to jump in the sea. Nine others followed him and they jumped in the sea and they were saved. 167 men followed the rule blindly, did not think about the risks, and that's where they died. So this is to me one of the reasons why we are not improving in safety anymore, because we have more and more people complying, but they're not thinking about risks anymore. Here is another reason that concerns me. We have a significant improvement in technology. Technology is the future. We have incredibly smart safety helmets these days that have got cameras in and speakers, and they have all kinds of in Australia for a company that was building roads. And this is their rollers on the road. So what happened in front of them, they have workers. And these workers, their job is to push the bitumen with their brooms so that the roller can come and um, uh, roll it flat. One of these workers were killed when he didn't see the roller coming in. So they asked me to install a proximity alert system on the workers. So each of the workers were fitted with a uh, transmitter on their body and there was a receiver here with an alarm. If they come too close, the alarm will go off. So this is what happened. Before they had the alert systems, they were about seven to eight meters away from the roller. And they were always looking back to see the roller coming because they were worried. Unfortunately, when we installed the detection zone, we realized that workers were now waiting for the roller to come close, waiting to hear the alarm, 
and then they move on and they're not looking back anymore. So what have we actually done here? We've given them a technological advance and unfortunately that advanced advance made them less aware of risks. And this is unfortunately the conflict between engineering and psychology. We have great engineering solutions, but the human being have got very different reactions. And the reactions that I see increasing, I call this atrophy, when they are not capable of responding anymore. The best example is also a tragic one. In United States and Canada, the rules for buses, school buses, are such strong rules that if a bus stops, all traffic must on both sides must stop and wait for the children to get off. So what have children learned? They've learned that if they jump off the bus, they can just run. There is no traffic. Now, unfortunately, on a wrong day, they run and the this young child was extremely fortunate to not to be killed by this truck. The lesson for me is again coming back to what Madam Minister had said. We have to educate children to be safety aware so when they come to work in the high risk industries that they have the skills to do that. This is what we have to be careful that we do not train our children with the wrong skills. Fortunately, there is a, there is a very positive uh, story. Humans are not the weakest link in safety. Humans are the strongest link in safety. And I want to give you some examples of the capabilities of what humans can do. Humans have a sixth sense, and only humans can act in this incredibly safe way. Look at the actions of this athlete. Um, I mean, I love our chances. You know, it's been. Uh, it's been... You can see that he is very impressed with himself and the young lady is obviously very much in love with him because he is so good. But he's a, he's a trained athlete. He's got a very good sense of sound of balls and bats on the baseball field. And he understood immediately what the risk was. I was personally involved in a near accident underground when I was working on that mine. And as we were walking down, me, myself, and another miner, he suddenly stopped me and said to me, wait, wait, wait. And when I looked in front of me, I saw that the whole side wall of this tunnel collapsed and a rock fell right into the path where we would have been. He had a sixth sense and he saved my life. Humans can do this. Only humans have compassion. Only humans can sacrifice. Humans are inventive. Humans are intuitive. And this is unfortunately the skills and capabilities that we forget about, about humans and what they can do. I'm sure you remember the, the uh, very famous example of the pilot who landed in the Hudson River. Now, here is what happened. He took off from New York airport and then he flew into uh, two flocks of birds and all his engines were cut off. And the, the, uh, uh, the tower at the airport tried to arrange for him to, to fly to a nearby airport or try to reach a nearby airport. And this is the audio of that day. Uh, yes, he, uh, it was a bird strike. Can I get him in for uh, runway one? Runway one, that's good. Okay, 1529, turn right 
Contact is 1649 radar contact is lost. You also got Newark Airport up at 2 o'clock in about 7 miles. Eagle 54718, Colonel Tank 210. In this moment, this pilot made the right decision. He knew he cannot reach the airport, and he knew he almost had to take a risk to save the lives of 152 people. And this is the kind of skills and capabilities that humans have. And it's quite often said, oh, but he was just fortunate. Well, if you talk to pilots, they will tell you that they save lives many more times than what human error causes accidents. And this is the, 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 the benefit of understanding and equipping our people with the right skills. They will save lives. What we also have to be very careful about is how we measure safety. We look at accident rates most of the time, and we look at what causes the accidents. But what we're not measuring is what proactive measurements, what is possible to happen, what is probable to happen, what can happen in the future. And unfortunately, everything in safety is focused on what already happened. Now, if I can remind you that Texas refinery, they were a very a successful organization before this accident in safety. Their performance by accident rates was in the top quarter of the industry. They were 16% better than the previous year of this accident. They were leading the industry, and yet they had this disaster. They were measuring the wrong things. And if you have a look at our quest for zero fatalities, and the quest for zero serious injuries. Those things are possible. But we have to be careful when we start measuring below that waterline. We have to achieve minor injuries, zero. Then eventually we have to achieve zero incidents. Then eventually we have to achieve zero near misses, zero human error, zero risk, and zero hazards. Does that not mean we would eventually have to have zero work? We cannot have zero hazards in a workplace. There are always risks there. We have to make sure we can get people to understand them. So an example, if you have a look at US highway fatalities, every year 30,000 people are killed there on highways in the United States. A simple solution would be, let's change the speed limit from 120 kilometers an hour to five kilometers an hour and we will eliminate all the accidents, but we will not have an economy. So here's the unfortunate thing, but there is a, a lesson in there. We have to understand that there will always be risk. So we have to invest into the people who understand that risk. Let me show you what I mean with the need to go beyond accident numbers. This is an intersection. And this intersection is very safe. They never have accidents here. But if you have a look at that lane behind the blue arrow, just watch what happens. And you see that vehicle has gone through and did not touch anybody or anything. Here it is in slow motion. Nobody's touched. Nothing happens. Now, when you look at this situation, everybody arrived alive at home. Everybody, nobody got hurt. Everybody goes home that day. And it's an injury-free, an accident-free, and harm-free work environment. This is an important point. If we are accident-free and injury-free, it does not mean we are safe. We are a long way from being safe. And I'll show you in a moment on a recent project that I've done in the mining industry that was quite eye-opening. The other thing we have to be very careful about is rewards. If we reward people for not having accidents, you get strange reactions from humans. So here is an example. We send people into the workplaces, and then we say to them, we don't want any injuries. And that's the, a noble ideal. We don't want any injuries. 
and then you see the accident rates come down. And we, have, we don't want any accidents. Then we start to reward people for being safe. Slowly but surely, the culture in the organization becomes apprehensive because safety is so important. Management wants to be safe. We don't want accidents. And then we become a focus on zero deviance. We don't want any deviance from our rules. And we punish people who are taking risks. And we have zero tolerance for risk taking. And the, the culture becomes anxious. And when we start to reward zero accidents, you start to see a strange phenomenon. The top red line is the lost time injury frequency rate. The yellow line is the looking good injury frequency rate. What it means is people start or people stop reporting accidents because they need to achieve the goals that management want. And it may change the organization in a fear culture. And it's almost as if there's a barrier in the organization. The closer we get to the next target of zero accidents, the more this barrier only allows good news and distorted news to reach the management. And the real risks, the bad news, stay low in the organization amongst the workers. They don't talk about this anymore. And this is what we call risk secrecy. And this is the most dangerous condition that we can reach in a company. Almost all the mine disasters that I've studied had this existing on their organizations. When the manager of Piper Alpha was asked by the, the, the inquiry, why did you not stop? Why did you, why did you not know about all the problems and deficiencies in your safety systems that we found after the disaster? There were so many problems and you didn't know about them. And he said, his answer was, your honor, I thought everything was okay because I never got a report that anything was wrong. People stopped talking to him because he was very proud about the safety achievement of Piper Alpha and everybody was so focused on safety, people didn't want to tell them bad news anymore. This example is, no, is very dramatic on the uh, deep water horizon. This is what happened. The tension in every drilling operation is between doing things safely and doing them fast. Time is money. And this job was costing BP a million dollars a day. The day of the accident, BP flew several managers to the Deepwater Horizon for a ceremony to congratulate the crew for seven years without an injury. For seven years without an injury. Seven years without an injury. For seven years without an injury. So BP was on the rig to give them an award for seven years without an injury. This is the, the, the contractor. It is obviously not true. It is not possible to work on an oil rig, a drilling rig, for seven years and no one has a scratch on them. So here's the problem. The BP management obviously knew it was impossible, yet they pretended that it was possible. And the, 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 the contractor company, they pretended that they, that they achieved this impossible goal. And this is unfortunately what happens when we are losing touch with reality in organizations. There are some incredibly good solutions in personal safety that is being developed around the world now. And I want to share some with you. New developments in mine safety. This is a very different kind of mine. This is a mine, diamond mining company that mines diamonds off the seabed in Namibia. And what you see there is a very complicated operation. It is a ship in sea, that is a processing plant, and this is a helicopter pad. So on a daily basis, they have incredibly high risks on the ship, and they suck diamonds from the seabed. What this organization has been doing is they installed an operational risk management system, and, but they worried that this could make people falsely confident. So this is based on the ICMM, uh, International uh, Council for Mining and Metallurgy, where every risk on this, on this, on this uh, rig has a risk owner, a person accountable for it. But what they've also done is they have trained workers on this, uh, company, on this uh, ship 
under the lead of uh, what they call Delta Commanders. Delta stands for the deep elimination of latent triggers of accidents. So these Delta Commanders are in charge of three or four people that they've trained and they do their normal jobs, but then at a particular day, a Delta Commander, and there are three, three types, the yellow commander can call his three or four team members together. They walk into the office or position of a manager and they challenge him randomly about risks in his command, under his command. Or they uh, test the person's capability, the, the, the department's capability to manage and respond to catastrophic accidents. Or they say to them, here is a risk that you have not thought about. How will you control this risk? Now, this, this is based on the company Netflix, who realized that they need to test their own software themselves because the uh, software hackers are attacking them. So they employed people inside Netflix to hack their own uh, software. And this is what they've applied in this case. This has had incredibly positive outcomes. Here is just one example. This is the bottom of the ship at the back. They discovered during one of these strikes that this door had been opened and they welded it onto the side here so that the door is permanently open. Because they had a problem, this door was the reason for several small finger accidents. And so the supervisor decided to, to, to keep it permanently open and no one will be injured anymore. But what they've actually done in, inadvertently is this is a, a compartment door that is incredibly important for the work so that water does not rush into the bottom of the ship if it's in, in very high seas, which is what happened in the ferry disaster uh, in Belgium some years ago. So what they've done, they've shifted their focus from reactive safety measurement to proactive safety measurement. Another advancement that uh, exists, and this is a very large mining company. Uh, you probably know who they are, but I can't name them because uh, I'm not sure uh, they, they would want me to do that. But they employ 80,000 people. They have 41 mines around the, around the world. And they started with this process called elimination of fatalities. They had a teams of people operating in a company, visiting all 41 mines, and the sole focus was to identify possible fatal risks. And the teams would be 10 to 12 managers and specialists. They would visit, they visited all 40 sites for a week. So it took two years to do this. And what they did is they started talking to employees. They didn't talk to management. They started talking to employees who knew a lot of problems, but they were too afraid to talk about it. And from these people, they gained incredible insights. They found in this company hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of potential fatal accidents that were sitting there waiting to happen. And I'll show you an example of one now. But what was interesting is that in 14% of the cases of these it's, over two, it's almost 2,000 fatal accidents that was uh, waiting to happen. 14% the workers didn't know about. All the others they knew about. They underestimated them. There were rewards for them to ignore it. They were focusing on uh, inherent and tolerated. They tolerated the risk. So here's an example. What you see there is a mine that never had a fatal accident. It has a very, very good safety record, and no one had realized what catastrophic potential exists here. This is the air intake for the underground operation, which is on this side. And so this is the lifeline of the workers, fresh air for the miners. What is there is a power generation plant. And this is where the trucks come to fill their tanks with fuel. So what they realized is that underneath this area here, they positioned the fuel tanks underneath the air intake of the mine. If anything goes wrong here, 
120 people could be killed. This would never feature in any accident measurement. And this is another example where the absence of accidents does not mean we are safe. This organization had gone ahead and had done some enormous improvements in all these areas of their safety in order to improve their capability. They've moved to think and expect and measure what is probable and possible. Beyond that is what we call latent indicators. These, just the example what I just gave you. Now, this has turned into what I call the coefficient of chronic unease. This is a, 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 a formula with which companies can actually measure, measure their exposure to fatal risks in the organization. And the very first one is how openly are people reporting accidents? And here's what we found in this research. For every one near miss incident that they cannot hide, there were three near miss incidents that the workers could easily not talk about and no one would know. Here is an example. This happened on a mine site. They were installing a pump and you can see that they're underneath the load there because they want to align it and then it starts to slip. Now, you can clearly see there's huge damage here. They could not hide this incident. But then you get this kind of incident. He's going to release that beam with a crowbar and he starts to hit it in order to get it loose. Now watch what happens. He hits it. And this is now on a tight uh, energy tight there. And then it comes loose and nearly crushes his head. Now, of course, they don't have to report this incident and no one will know except the workers in this area. And unfortunately, this is what happens in organizations that are not driving safety in the right direction. This risk transparency is very low. There are several other indicators. There are seven in total. Do they have a wide focus on risks or do they only look at risks they've already had? Do they do these self challenges of their system like the diamond mining company did? And if they have a situation where the uh, small injury rates are decreasing, but serious injury rates are increasing, then they're heading for disaster, like we're finding in the industry right now. To what extent are they controlling risks through the elimination of, of accidents, of risks? And to what extent do they have active compliance as again blind compliance, the examples I gave you? And to what extent do they see systems, the cause of accidents, or do they blame people? Now we have this formula that can actually measure whether the company is on the uh, increasing risk exposure or decreasing. And this is the latest development that exists in measuring latent triggers. So investing in OHS, if you have a look at an organization, this is where the values, the beliefs, the culture exist in the organization. And this is where we do planning and uh, a, a measurement of performance. We make decisions. This is where we train people. We uh, provide supervision. We uh, discipline people for mistakes. And this is what leads to people's behavior and the execution of tasks. And most of the time, we have good control, good output, and good results. 
Only very rarely do we see accidents. Now, I'm sure you have heard and seen the, uh, the hierarchy of control that says the more you can eliminate risks, the better, or substitute them. These are the least effective areas of risk control if you just put administrative procedures in place or you give people personal protective equipment. Now, this is the hierarchy of control. Now, what happens is it is quite often the case that the investment in safety is in this area because this is cheaper and it's easier to do. Elimination of risks and the substitution of risks is not that easy to do. But that is where the benefits of investment really come from. And unfortunately, this is not where we're taking this. If we focus on the prevention of injuries, we are only preventing injuries. We are not optimizing the organizations. And these four strategies that I'm proposing to you here are very much at the forefront of thinking in OHS around the world. It says we have to improve the way in which we discover risks in the business. We cannot wait for accidents to happen and only prevent those. We have to think forward at what is possible, what can happen, like the examples I showed you. We must also optimize our capability. We must optimize our capability in people because people are the biggest, uh, the best capability we have. We have to integrate safety into operational processes. Most of the time, safety is standing on the side and tries to slow the production process down. But if we integrate it, we are far more effective. And then to come back to what uh, the previous speakers and Madam Minister said, the culture is the most important. We should, instead of investing on preventing injuries, we should invest more at the upstream level of the organization where we can integrate where we transform culture. Because that upstream investment compared to the downstream investment, this builds capacity. If you invest downstream, it consumes capacity. Upstream investment, it streamlines your safety and your operational processes. If you just prevent injuries, you complicate the processes. Upstream investment integrates safety into the operations and downstream keeps it separate. Upstream investment also, those strategies that I've shown you, also improves your overall efficiency in the organization. So you are actually increasing profits to your bottom line. If you only prevent accidents, you are taking money away from your bottom line. This is long term, that is short term. And this is what we do. We are reducing our exposure to catastrophic events as against we're increasing our exposure to catastrophic events. Because here's what happens. The more we invest in only preventing accidents, the higher the probability of fatal accidents like we see in the mining industry around the world now and the probability of catastrophic events. Because we don't have the capacity or resources left after we spend all the, all the time on small accidents. Now, there is an organization that is very similar to the insights that I gained working underground, where the capabilities of people are paramount. And many countries have what they call aircraft carriers. Now, these aircraft carriers, doesn't matter which country, has a unique three levels of safety. On the ship itself, it is traditional safety, such as what we know, Navy safety. In the jets that land on them, they have what is called aviation safety, very advanced technology. But on this deck, there is a very different safety. It is the kind of safety that I experienced on the ground. 
I want to show you what happens. These aircraft carriers, they are incredible. They are so busy that they're equally busy than the world's busiest airport, Atlanta. They shrunk it down to two football fields. And then underneath that, they have 90 jets and a million gallons of fuel. They have 5,000 soldiers underneath that ship. They have massive warehouses and they sit on top of two nuclear plants. And then they land jets at 160 miles an hour every 42 seconds. This is the most dangerous workplace in the world. They have achieved what I call deep safety. Let me show you what I mean. The ship is sailing and you see this cable over here, that plane, that jet at 160 miles an hour, there's a hook must catch this cable. Look what happens. Every 42 seconds, they land a plane. And they take off on the other side. They seldom have accidents, but you know what? They don't measure accidents or the absence of accidents as their success rate or not. I'll show you in a moment what they do measure. They do this with incredible levels of safety, but sometimes things go wrong. And when things go wrong, this is what happens. Single seat FA-18 Hornet traps. The arresting cable stretches to the brink. The cable breaks and the plane disappears over the edge. The pilot ejects and this cable comes back and this worker here jumps. Not once, but twice. And the cable whips underneath him. Now, that is not luck or fortunate. Their workers are invested in. Their workers are aware. They think every moment on that ship. They are capable people. And what they've done, they've developed a very different definition for safety. Safety on these ships is the readiness to respond to risks towards resilience. I would strongly encourage you to make this your definition of safety and to invest in creating this readiness in your minds, in your people, in your managements, in your systems to look for and respond to risks constantly. And there is one incredible way in which you can do this, and that is through investment in leadership. Leadership makes the difference on all the organizations that I've visited. And they are not just managers who do a job, a technical job. This is what we do when we manage. We make plans, we set targets, we provide rules, we organize work, reward results, and we apply our expertise. Management is something different. Managers share passion leaders uh, sorry managers issue plans leaders share passion leaders inspire from the front they dare to differ they empower others they touch hearts they show competence this is a leader leadership model that we've developed based on the life of one of the greatest leaders of our time nelson mandela he's not a manager people adored him because he inspired people but he also let people differ and this is what we need to be able to do we need to encourage people in our workplaces to differ from us because if they differ from us if they challenge us they will tell us of the knowledge they have of what can go wrong around them which we don't know about because they don't tell us this is the biggest investment you can make ladies and gentlemen that is the end of my talk. Thank you.
And if I can try to say, Tezekur Ederon. Thank you very much.